Welcome to South Point Church Online. We want to say hi wherever you're watching from today, whether it's here locally in our county or where it's anywhere in our state or maybe even our country or maybe anywhere in the world. And if this is your first time joining us, man, we are so fired up that you're here. We hope to see you again. Hey, my name is Matt and I'm part of the team here at South Point. The very first thing I want to ask is if you're thinking, hey, Matt, why should I stick around? today and listen to this. It's because we're going to share a truth that applies to everyone regardless of where you're at with faith. It doesn't matter if you showed up today and you're just kind of exploring who Jesus is. It doesn't matter if you have kind of a different background or you've been a follower of Jesus. Today we're going to address something that applies to every single one of us and I'm going to put it up on the screen and it's this. Everyone faces the unavoidable dips in life that can drive our well-being into a ditch if we don't have the guardrails of resilience to help us. Listen, I'm not telling you something that you don't already know. Listen, all of us will experience the ups and the downs of life. And if we're really honest, regardless of where we're at with faith, all of us will have highs, but all of us will also have lows where the downturn of life sometimes can be so steep that sometimes we can end up crashing and harming ourselves and others. And the reality is, is that will harm our well-being, our physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. And one of the things that we can do is we need resilience as a guardrail to cushion us from that thing. And so here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to show you what that looks like in everyday life. I'm going to put this up on the screen. And this actually comes from week one's message, right? We said God made us holistic beings. And this idea is using spirituality to ignore how God holistically made us is not only wrong, it's harmful. That we're physical beings, mental beings, spiritual, and emotional. Now, I know from personal experience, and my bet is from personal experience, that you have experienced what I'm about to explain. You know, decade or so ago, I had some physical chronic illness. For about a year, I had a bunch of symptoms, and then for two years, I was chronically ill. And if you've ever had a physical injury or a chronic physical illness, you know that if you have an injury or illness in your physical body, that it can impact you emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. And so that can impact your well-being. Well, what's true of us physically is also true of us mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. I mean, if you asked anybody that's ever been through a divorce, that divorce impacted them emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. And it impacted all those areas of the life. They may have stopped eating. They may have stopped exercising. If you've ever experienced uh, being in a toxic relationship, you know that that has an impact on you mentally, spiritually, and physically. Maybe you were betrayed by a friend. Uh, they said they wouldn't tell a secret or, or they just kind of abandoned you. And that hurt created emotional, mental, and physical pain, right? And then sometimes we ask, where's God in this? You know this and I know this. We all know this, that there are times in our life where the downturns or dips of life through trauma or illness impact not just one area of our life. They impact all of our well-being, including our mental health. Now, here's why sticking around matters so much for every single person watching, regardless of where you're at with faith, whether you have none, different, or you've grown up with Jesus. And I'm going to put it on the screen, and it's this right there. Just as trauma and illness impact all of us, so does resilience. Just like if we have physical trauma that impacts us mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, did you know that if we have some resilience in our spiritual area or in our emotional area, that that may help us do that physical thing? Maybe if we experience something that is emotionally devastating, that if we have resilience in the other areas, that it will help be a guardrail to cushion us from coming into a dive where we crash and we hurt ourselves and others. Now, you can see this, right? Just like trauma and illness impacts all of us, resilience can also help all of us. Now, I do want to be clear and I do want to be honest. Resilience is not a cure for trauma or for illness, but it can be something that lessens the damage in our life. And this leaves all of us today. It leaves me. It leaves you. It leaves we asking this important question that we need an answer to. And it's this right here. How do we, how do we build resilience so when the unavoidable dips, 
Listen, none of us get a pass in life. This is why I love Jesus so much. Jesus tells us that we will experience trouble in this world. There are unavoidable dips. It doesn't matter how much resilience we have, the dips or the downturns are gonna come. We have guardrails to help lessen the damage. All of us need the answer to this question. So when those unavoidable dips come, we have some cushion, we have some margin, we have something that helps protect us in this. And that are some pretty cool and amazing news. Matter of fact, this cool and amazing news is why I am a passionate follower of Jesus. You know, God knew that every single human being would deal with the ups and downs of life. God knew that you, that I, that we would need resilience. And what's amazing is, is God reveals through his relationship with people throughout all of history, what resilience not only looks like, but how it's a God-given thing to help all of us. And there'll be some surprising unexpected things about resilience as we go through this that we will discover together today so that when those unavoidable dips happen, that you, that I, that we will have a cushion to lessen the damage that dip could potentially bring. And so today, here's what I want to do. I want to look at two people who had an amazing relationship with God and how in the relationship with God, they both faced a dip, but they also had some resilience in their life to help them move forward and take the next steps. Now, the first one is a guy named Elijah. Now, some of you that grew up in church world or grew up in church, you know Elijah as an Old Testament prophet. But I know that there are many watching who you didn't kind of grow up in church. And so Elijah was this guy. He was a really good friend of God. Now, Elijah is someone that God had asked to kind of communicate to his fellow countrymen, his nation, kind of the rules and the structure that God had already given them so that they could be the examples that they were meant to be to the rest of the world. Elijah had this deep relationship with God and God used Elijah to speak to these people and had used Elijah to do these amazing miracles and these amazing things. And matter of fact, this guy Elijah that had a great relationship with God had just come off of one of these big highs where God had supernaturally shown up and done this miracle and turned the hearts of his people towards God. But just like there are highs, there are lows. And we're gonna catch Elijah in a low, in a dip, in a downturn. We see this in 1 Kings 19, we're gonna put it on the screen, it says this, he, Elijah, sat down under a solitary broom tree and he prayed that he might die. I mean, think about it. This guy, Elijah, was a close friend of God. He was doing exactly what he was supposed to do. He was present with God. There was, he was doing all the right things, yet he didn't feel good. And then here's what he said, and I love the honesty that the Bible gives us. He says, I have had enough, Lord. I just wanna ask a quick question to those of you watching online. Have you ever said that? Hey, God, I've just had enough. If you've ever prayed that prayer, God, I've had enough, you are not alone. He said, I've had enough, he said. He said, take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Here we see Elijah in what you and I today would call clinical depression. He was so sad. Things had broken. He was tired. He was exhausted. He got to the point where he didn't even want to live and he needed something. And then we continue on as we, as we read the text and the event. It says, then he lay down and slept. He did what we should all do when we get exhausted and we feel that way. He just got a good night's sleep. It said he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. So I want you to catch this picture. He's not doing real good. He's told God he's had enough, right? He's in this downward spiral. So what does he do? He sleeps. And then God shows up, his good friend, and says, listen, it's not enough that you just get some sleep. He says, you need some food. And then we go on, and it says this. Next slide. It says, so he ate and drank, and then he laid down again. So he slept. He ate a meal and then he went back and took another nap. I love how honest this scripture is to us. And it says, then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more. So there's this pattern where Elijah in this valley, in this dip, needs some things that will build resilience in him. He needs to get some sleep and he needs to eat some food, right? But it doesn't just finish there because you'll need the journey ahead will be too much for you. 
because we all should be moving forward because God has a plan for all of us. And we see it on the next verse. It says, so he got up and ate and drank and the food gave him enough strength. So there was this idea of sleep and food strengthened him to travel for 40 days and 40 nights to the Mount Sinai, the Mount of God, where he would meet with God and have a conversation. And it's so easy in our modern day to read through this account of Elijah when he faced this kind of depressive episode, but there are three unique things in this passage that we're told that build resilience back into Elijah as he's in his dip. One is sleep. The second is food. Second or third, God is involved. And then fourth, he has to take a 40-day journey, which provides some physical exercise and some invigoration. And so we're going to come to that a little bit later in the message. We're going to talk about how those build resilience in our life. But the second person that we want to talk about who faced the biggest dip in all of eternity, you've probably heard of him, his name is Jesus. You see, Jesus lived a perfect life where all he did was love the unlovable and stuck up for people and told the truth and did what was right and good at every turn. And you know what he got for it? He got murdered. You want to talk about a dip? He was unjustly condemned and then tortured and then crucified on a cross. And here's what's amazing about Jesus is that as they nailed him to a cross in the middle of this most downward, destructive dip that a human being could face, as they nailed him to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. There must have been this resilience built into Jesus. And what's amazing is, is that we look about eight to 10 weeks out before Jesus faced what we'd call Passion Week, there were some things that built resilience into the life of Jesus. And we're gonna take a brief look at them so we can see how they might apply to us and how we can build resilience in our own life. And so I wanna put up on the screen, Jesus before the cross. Jesus had this experience called the transfiguration. And so if you grew up in church, it's where Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Uh, they went to this mountaintop, just the four of them, and Jesus was praying, God shows up, and then Elijah that we just talked about and Moses show up, and Jesus is transformed, and they see Jesus as he truly is. And so if you didn't go to church, all that means is, is Jesus took his disciples, his posse, they went to go pray together, and they got to see Jesus as he truly was. And what's amazing is, is that Jesus got to experience some authentic connection where his friends, his closest friends, Peter, James, and John, right? And then we told Elijah was a really close friend of God. Elijah shows up, Moses shows up, and God tells his friends, not only this is my son, but that he is loved. In this, eight to 10 weeks before, Jesus has this event where he is gathered with his friends and he has authentic connection with his heavenly father and his friends. He just has time and space for authentic connection. And then comes Palm Sunday. We call it the triumphant entry. It's this big celebration where Jesus rides on the back of a donkey. He usually walked a lot, but this time he chose to enjoy the benefit of riding on a donkey as a king would ride in um, to uh, into a city and people were cheering for him and he, he received that celebration. That was awesome. And then the night before, the night he's betrayed, he had something called the Passover meal. And Jesus says, I have eagerly desired. Jesus was looking forward to this feast with friends where they ate lots of food, they were together. I mean, have you ever had a barbecue or a cookout or a large dinner with a large group of friends? I mean, that's basically what Jesus did. Before he was going to go into his dip, he wanted to spend time with his friends around a good old fashioned meal. But before he faced the darkest part of his dip, he was overwhelmed and he took his closest friends again, Peter, James, and John, to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed and he said, my soul is overwhelmed to death. And he communed with God. And in this, we can see where God gave his son and God gives us some ideas of what it looks like to build some resilience in. So when we are experiencing the dip, because none of us get to avoid the dip, you can love Jesus, you can follow Jesus, you can do all the right things. We live in a busted and broken world. The dip or the downturn is gonna come even if we don't want it. But the good news is that God has given us some great and amazing gifts 
that build resilience so that that dip doesn't have to lead to a crash that creates damage in our lives and the lives of others. It's authentic connection, there's celebration, there's feasting with friends, and there's communion with God. So my hope and my prayer was to give us three things that I wanna talk about today, just briefly. Three areas where we need to build resilience. So as we go through the ups and the dips or downs of life, that we can have resilience so that when we are in those dips or those downturns, we don't create extra damage or harm in our lives or the lives of people that we love. And I get these examples from the life of Jesus and how God stepped into Elijah's life. And today, I'm gonna look at three things that I think are gonna be easy to memorize. I call it the who, the how, and the what. How do we build resilience in the who, and the how, and the what? And I think God will help all of us. If we build resilience in these areas, it will be helpful as we go through life. And so here's the first part of the resilience we need to build. Who's telling our true story? Who's telling our true story? If we're all honest, everyone is vying for our attention to speak into our lives to tell us what kind of story our life should tell. We have a bunch of other people in our lives trying to tell us what we should be. We have ourselves, and then we have God, our creator. And here's why building resilience in this area is so important. Like, I need everyone, I know you might be like having kids or, or like looking at the chat, so I want you to stop. Here's why this is so important. The who's that we surround ourselves with shape the life that we live. Let me say that one more time. The who's that we surround our life with actually shape the kind of life that we end up with. And so, who do we have in our lives that are help shaping us? Do we have others that are for us? Do we have others that just want something from us? Do we have others who have no real concern about us but just want something from us? How about ourselves? How, you know, can we trust ourselves? And I've heard people say, well, I trust myself better than anybody else. And, or, or God, who's help telling our true story? You know, as I thought about this, I, I thought about others, and it got me to ask a question. I don't know how many parents we have. Maybe you just want to type "parent" in the chat if you're a, in the chat if you're a parent, right? Have you ever heard people without kids tell you how to parent when when they don't have kids, and you just want to laugh at them and go, "Yeah, uh huh." Wait till you have them, and it'll be yours. Have you ever heard someone who's dead broke try to give financial advice to somebody else? You're just like, "Why are you doing that?" And what's even funnier is people who have busted and broken relationships, romantic relationships, are trying to tell people what their marriage should look like. Listen, who do you want to help you tell your true story, the story that you were meant for? And then ourselves, I often ask this question, and, and you can maybe put an emoji in the chat if you want, but you know what I've discovered, and here's my question, raise your hand if you have any regrets in life. I have tons of them. I'm, I'm raising my hand right with everyone else, right? Like I have regrets. You know the thing I know about regrets and that you know about regrets? Your regrets are basically the decisions that you made when you said, oh, I trust myself more than my parents, I trust myself more than God, and I trust myself more than all the other advice everyone's giving me, and the regret is that you trusted yourself. And so when we talk about the who's telling our true story, we need to ask, is it others? Is it self? Or is it God? Who are the who's that are heading in the same direction? Who are the who's that, that God is working in? Who are the who's that are going in the same direction so that as we go through the ups and downs of life will help us and cushion and encourage us to take the right steps? True story. Um, when I was younger, uh, my mom passed away when I was about 11 years old or nine, somewhere between nine and 11. My memory is fuzzy from back then, um, but my grandmother, who I was pretty close to, after the funeral, um, my grandmother stopped calling, my grandmother stopped visiting, and my grandmother stopped uh, writing letters and sending like birthday cards and stuff like that. And I was pretty traumatized. Um, I had already lost my mom, and then all of a sudden my grandmother, who I really loved and cherished, was all of a sudden out of my life. And I began to tell myself this story, well, you know, maybe my mom died because of me, she took her own life, and maybe my grandma thinks it's my fault, and maybe she's mad at me, and she doesn't love me either. And so I began to tell myself a story. Um, and and my, my biological dad and my counselor didn't really tell me what was going on, so I just assumed that she didn't love me. 
But when I got out on my own at about 17 or 18 and, and kind of uh, was no longer a ward of state, my grandmother reached out to me. And what I discovered was is that my biological dad had told her that it would not be good for her to be in contact with me and asked her not to contact me. Um, as uh, the legal guardian, he was allowed to do that. And it, be it was a request of my counselor who was a child molester who he gave my dad that advice. And it was a false and wrong story that led to a untrue story. And so I want to ask a serious question about resilience. Who are the who's in our lives that are help shaping the true story that God has for you? You know, core value number four here at South Point is this, is we are better together. Listen, there are no perfect people. We're all flawed, we'll all disappoint each other, but we believe in doing life together. And so if you've never been a part of a small group, I really wanna encourage you to do that. And I'm gonna talk at the end of the message about a specific small group that we're gonna launch very soon that I wanna encourage everyone to go through. But I wanna ask who's telling the true story? Is it others, is it self, or is it God? And what I love about Jesus in the garden of the Gethsemane, and in on the mountain as he prayed. His heavenly father is the one that told him the true story. And because Jesus trust, chose to trust God's true story, we can experience eternal life and hell and death has been conquered. Who are the who's that you're surrounding yourself with? Who are your friends? Which leads me, to resilience area number two, which is this. And it's how do we filter our thoughts? Man, this is so important because I wanna let you in on a little inside. Maybe nobody's ever said this aloud, but this is so true. Listen, every single person, whether you're a follower of Jesus, whether you have different faith, whether uh, no matter where you're at on the Facebook, we all have thoughts that come in our mind that are untrue. Just because you have a thought doesn't make it true. We all have hurtful thoughts. They might not be true, they may be true, they may be somewhere in the middle. Maybe it's an email, maybe it's a text, maybe it's an unkind statement, maybe it's someone who makes fun of you, maybe it's someone who treats you wrongly in the store. We all have hurtful thoughts. We all imagine crazy things. We all think wacky thoughts. All of us have these random thoughts, hurtful thoughts, untrue thoughts, and the question is, just because we have a thought doesn't mean it's right, it doesn't mean it's true, and it doesn't mean that we should act on it. And here's why the how. How do we filter our thoughts is so important to our resilience. Now, again, I want you to kind of stop and focus, and here's why this is so important. Because how we think leads to how we act. So maybe you just wanna type in think equals act. How we think equals how we act. That's why how do we filter our thoughts is such a big part of our resilience because we have so many thoughts coming in and out of our brain. How do we know which ones we should follow and act upon? And listen, here's the reality. Input will always equal output. Now, I don't mean this to be mean because I love Netflix and Hulu. Like, I, I watch new stuff, right? Like, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. But I just gotta let you know. Listen, here's the truth, right? Like, like, listen, Netflix and Hulu, like, don't have your best. They shouldn't be the filter for what you think. I don't care which news organization you watch. I don't care if it's Fox, CNN, AP, or whatever you get your news for. They shouldn't be the filter for your thoughts. I, I don't care if you're on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok. That shouldn't be the filter of your thoughts because none of those places are for you. You know what they're for? They're for making money. You are the resource that they're trying to get money from. And at South Point, we have this old saying, anyone who would die for you is for you. Jesus died for you. So one of the things that builds resilience is, what is the filter of our thoughts? And here's where there's one scripture that has been so instrumental in my life and I wanna share it with you. The Apostles Paul is speaking to a group of Christ followers who are very diverse. Some had no background in faith, some had pagan backgrounds in faith, and some had come from the Jewish faith, but they had all encountered this, the power of Jesus and they all said yes. And so Paul writes us this letter in 2 Corinthians, and we're gonna put it up on the screen as this. He says, we take captive. You see those untrue thoughts, those hurtful thoughts, those imagined thoughts, those wacky thoughts. He said, we take captive 
every thought and we make it obedience to Christ. True story, I heard this way back. Oh my gosh, I was a young follower of Jesus. And I don't exactly remember where I heard the story, but someone was interviewing a treasury agent. Someone who worked for like, um, whatever they call it, the DEA uh, department of something. And their specialty was in counterfeit. And so in the interview, as they were talking about counterfeit and money and how you would know that, they were surprised because the agent who was kind of in this counterfeit uh, for checks, and for money, surprised the interviewer by saying this, I don't study fakes. He said, I study the genuine. And if I study the genuine inside and out, the fake will stick out like a sore thumb because I know the genuine so well. We take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. One of the ways that we can build resilience in our emotion and in our spirit and our physical and our mental is to bring every thought captive. And so one of the things that we need to do is every day, we should be going to the author, the one who died for us and go, what is the story God you have for me today? Not Netflix, not Hulu, not Facebook, not CNN or Fox or any other organization, not any other, other social media. God, we are coming to you, not any other person. God, how should I filter my thoughts? Because if you become the filter of my thoughts, if I let you filter my thoughts, then the actions that I live out will be right, good and true and pleasing exactly like what Jesus did. So one of the ways that we can build resilience is to take captive every thought and make it into obedience of Christ. We should start off with God's word as the filter for our lives and bring every thought. Because here's the truth, whether you have no faith, different faith, or you grew up as a follower, all of us are gonna have untrue thoughts, all of us are gonna have hurtful thoughts, all of us are gonna have imaginary thoughts, and all of us are gonna have wacky thoughts. And what is the filter that will lead to life so that when we're in the dip, we do not make poor choices? How do we filter the thoughts that come into our minds every day? One of the things that I love for this is the U version. It's a downloadable app. You can um, download your phone and it'll send you a verse today. And when I get to the challenge section, I'm gonna hit that up again. But here's the third area that we can build resilience in and it's this right here. What habits are helping or hurting? What habits in our life? Because here's something you already know. Listen, I don't have to tell you this. You already know this, that when you are in a downfall, when you're in a dip, when you are on the downward turn and things don't seem good, you are, and I and we are down to our reflexes. Have you ever almost been in a car accident and then you're just down to whatever your reflexes are? If a cuss word comes out, that's your reflex. If your arm goes out to protect like someone you're with, you're like loving care, you're down to your reflexes when you're in that in that downturn. And I love what um, Justin Early in the book, The Common Rule writes. He said, habits form more than our schedules, they form our souls. What habits do we have in our lives? that are forming who we are in the inside. So when the unavoidable dip comes, we've built some resilience in the whole part of our physical body, our mental, our emotions, and our spiritual. And I wanna just give three that are so important. Matter of fact, they're what exactly God gave Elijah, and we're gonna put them up on the screen, and it's here, right here. The first one is sleep. There's a book called Why We Sleep, and it is an amazing read. This book lets us know from a scientific perspective that sleep is one of the best things that you can do for your brain. They've done multiple studies. Did you know that when you go to sleep, what it does is your brain cells shrink so that you can transfer uh, memories and the things that you've learned from that day to your long-term memory. It allows your body to detoxify. Your sleep patterns allow your brain to heal heal and to rest. Sleep uh, does things for your genome. Matter of fact, they did a study and they said, if you only got four hours of sleep, what does your, um, your immune system do? It is reduced by 70% at four hours of sleep. If you get four hours of sleep, your immune system is reduced 70%. They talk about if you don't regularly get seven to nine hours of sleep, you begin to um, unlock or, or kind of uh, your genome, they say you'll unlock genes. When you don't get enough sleep, what happens is, 
is you start locking up and closing the good genes for immunity and start opening up other genes that uh, allow for sickness. Matter of fact, the World Health Organization made this statement that shift work overnight is a carcinogen because people aren't getting the kind of sleep, the deep, the light, and the REM sleep they need. Sleep is one of the most powerful things that you and I can do. Matter of fact, when I went into the recovery process, because I have a very addictive personality, and there's a season in my life where I was addicted to a lot of bad things, and there was an acronym that they teach you in recovery, it's called HALT. You don't, you stop, HALT, you know, HALT means to stop, right? You stop whenever you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. You know, hangry, have you ever heard that statement? Snickers actually made a whole commercial about it. It's because there's some truth about that. Um, we need sleep, so if you are tired, you shouldn't be making decisions. You shouldn't be having hard conversations. You should get some sleep. Sleep is one of the best things that you can do for your brain and for your physical health. There's a great book. There's so much science. I'd love to nerd out on you, but then everyone would leave, and so I'm not going to nerd out. But you know what? Elijah needed sleep. If you are not getting regularly healthy sleep, it will impact your physical body, it will impact your emotional, and it will impact you mentally. Matter of fact, there was a recent study that came out that actually from neuroscans connected um, insomnia and depression, and they don't know which one is causal, they just know that a lack of sleep and depression and other mental disorders and mental illnesses are tied because when we don't get good sleep, it impacts our brain. The next one is exercise. Jesus was a walker, and then when God asked Elijah to take a long trip, exercise. There's a professor, so this isn't just a doctor. This is someone who teaches other doctors. As her name is Professor um, uh, Wendy Suzuki. Um, she's written several books. She's a professor of neurology, and she's a professor of psychology, and she's written several books, and what she discovered is exercise is the number one thing you can do for brain and mental health. Uh, it helps you with neurogenesis, it helps you with neuroplasticity, and it helps you neurochemically. And there's so much nerdy stuff I could nerd out on you, and I won't do that. But what neurogenesis means is the physical structure of your brain is an improved and is healthier when you exercise. And what they mean by exercise is three times a week, 30 minutes with an elevated heart rate. If you elevate your heart rate by walking or rowing or like doing some, some kind of just, it doesn't have to be getting a gym membership, raising your heart rate for 30 minutes, three times a week, it will help your physical brain in an amazing way. Neuroplasticity, it fires up your neurons. It creates new pathways. It literally helps your brain undo trauma and damage. This has been proven, and it is neurochemically good for you. There's um, a dopamine associated and serotonin associated with exercise. If you want to talk about two things that you can do, the two of the best things that you could do, sleep and exercise, and then the third one seems obvious, but sometimes is so hard to practice. Friendship with God and friendship with others. And this is both what Elijah and Jesus had that carried them through their dip. Because all of us know, no matter how good a spouse you have, no matter how good of a parent you have, no matter how good of a friend you have, we're all imperfect. I'm as equally busted and broken as the next person. We will fail each other but God never fails. And here's what I love about God. When we fall short and we fail, the scripture tells us his love is unfailing. We may let go and we may fail, but God does not let go of us because of what Jesus did on the cross. He conquered hell and death. And so our friendship with God in the garden, Jesus prayed. Elijah went and talked to God that there's something about a friendship with God that centers us when our story feels so busted and broken. God tells us that we can have hope. And then the only thing Thing that wasn't good in the garden was that Adam was alone. Not only are human beings meant to be in relationship with God, human beings absolutely need to be in relationship with other human beings. We need to have friendship with others. And I get it. When we're in the downturn, we typically isolate, and that is the worst thing that we can do. We need to be with our friends in the downturn. And so those things help build resiliency. So if I had to sum it up in kind of just a night, nice tie bow, I would say it this way. Building resilience isn't a cure, but it can cushion the crash due to the unavoidable dips in life. 
And if I would say it this way as a passionate follower of Jesus, I love this, and it's this right here. God, God gives us resources. God is the author of rest and Sabbath and food and feast and fun. God is the author of all that is good. God gives us resources to build resilience. So when life happens, again, Jesus and John tells us that, that we will experience trouble in this world. So when life happens, we won't lose hope and into the tailspin, into a crash that harms us and others. So I wanna ask that question, who is surrounding our life? Who's speaking into our life? Is it others? Is it ourselves? Or is it God? How are we filtering the thoughts, the untrue, the harmful ones, the imaginary ones, the wacky ones? What filter are we using so that we can, uh, as our actions of our life are built upon uh, the way that we think? And lastly, what are the habits? Because when we enter that downturn, we're down to our reflexes. And our habits do more than our schedules. They form the state of our soul. I'm gonna close with this true story. And it's about my adopted dad. I love my adopted dad. My adopted dad is one of my heroes in life. My adopted dad had a fender bender. Now you have to understand, my adopted dad drove tons of miles. My adopted dad lived in one state and he would drive to another state because uh, he had a business there and he would do that every day. And he drove just tons of miles. And one day my dad was taking a short trip. It was for an errand or something. I don't even remember if it was from the office or from home, but he hopped in his car and he did what we all do. You know, I'm just taking a short trip. Nothing will happen. He didn't put his seatbelt on. And so that day, doing that short little errand, he got into a fender bender. And matter of fact, he got into such a small fender bender that the airbag didn't go off, but the impact did launch my dad forward and his face hit the windshield. And when his face hit the windshield, there's something called safety glass. And it breaks into little pieces, but it has this film so that the whole glass thing will go away so you don't get hurt. But a part of my dad's face went through the windshield and that glass all got stuck on there. And then when he came back, it, it left some damage. And I, I, won't, I won't tell you the, the gory details. All because my dad didn't put his seatbelt on. And my dad has told me that story. And as he went through that, he told me, he said, son, every time I get my car now, I put on the seatbelt. And you know why? You might be thinking, well, Matt, why are you telling us that story at the end of the message? Because seatbelts, don't stop accidents. Resilience does not stop illness, and resilience will not stop the downturns of life. We're gonna face those. But resilience is like a seatbelt that lessens the damage when we do. And so here's my challenge to every single person watching, even if you're just curious, whether maybe you just have a different faith or maybe you're a follower of Jesus. And here's one, the who's that you're surrounding yourself with. We have a small group that we're starting on March 29th. You can reach out to our small groups pastor. It's called Rooted. Our whole staff went through this. It's a 10 week small group. It's where you get to know other people and understand the rhythms of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And you build some spiritual habits that build some resilience in your life. Man, it was an amazing small group. I went through it. I really want to encourage you to go through it. If you're watching and going, hey, I need some who's in my life to support me, and I need to have some real friends in my life who are heading in the same direction, please, please go online and sign up for our Rooted Small Groups starting March 29th. Maybe for the how to filter our thoughts, I love the YouVersion Bible app. It sends you a verse a day. And it's literally, you just open your phone and it says, hey, you have a notification. You click on the notification and the verse of the day comes up. And they have this little thing they call it a street. So my challenge to some of you that go, listen, I have some friends or, you know, I'm doing this, but I need something to filter my thoughts. Maybe just looking at a verse a day and go, I'm going to have a 30-day streak on you version because it counts the number of days you get it in a row. Others of you, you might be going, what is a habit? And I wanna really encourage you today, if you're here and you're doing no exercise or you have poor sleep habits, would you consider a small step? Maybe it's moving from six hours of sleep a night to seven hours of sleep a night. Maybe for you, if you're not exercising, maybe, maybe you're a mom, maybe you just have a really busy job. Maybe it's three 10 minute walks around the block at your job so that over a week, you've gotten in three 30 minute walks. Take a small step because Jesus, and God have a real story, and God loves you. Anyone that would die for you is for you. And if we build resilience, it will keep us from the harm, these gifts that God gives us. 
so that as we go through this, these other areas of life holistically will help us navigate when those downturns come. I just want to say thanks for joining us. I'm going to say a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, God, thank you that you love us. Thank you for the example of Elijah and Jesus, God. Thank you that you give us the gift of rest. Thank you for the gift of taste buds and bacon and chocolate and food. God, thank you for the gift of relationships and friendships, God. God, thank you for the gift that we can commune and pray, not because we earned it or deserved it, because of what Jesus did on the cross. God, I pray for anyone watching and listening that we would take some small step to build resilience so that we wouldn't harm the life that we want or the life that you want for us. This is our hope and prayer in Jesus' name. And never forget, you matter deeply to God.